关联性呢？啊，那么在这个直播开始之前呢，我想给大家先介绍一下我们今天的嘉宾，咱们重庆大学土木工程学院的院长杨庆山教授，杨教授。给大家打个招呼。你好，大家好。嗯，好的。那今天呢，杨教授啊，将会和我一起走进我们土木工程学院的结构实验室，来一起为大家揭秘我们给冬奥究竟做了哪些保障，可以吗？好，谢谢谢谢。好的，那就进。好，欢迎大家来到我们呃，大家好，我们大家介绍一下这个土木工程学院的情况。Welcome to the School of 这个、Let me give you a brief introduction about our university. We were founded in 1929, and the School of Civil Engineering was established in 1935. And right now, we are ranking fifth nationwide in terms of uh, civil engineering. So we are quite professional and capable. In this particular profession, so to Thank So we are now undertaking a program called Science and Technology Empowering Winter Olympics. We are currently doing two programs, and the other program is Culturally Creative Industry, and that is another laboratory, and we won't cover that in today's program. In the future, we'll travel to Zhang Jiakou from Beijing. If you take the high-speed uh, railway, you will see some of the products that we designed at Chongqing University. So today, our program will mainly be focusing on engineering side because we want the Winter Olympics to become humanist, green, and economical. So we want to deliver a fantastic Olympic Winter Games to demonstrate high-quality economy and low-carbon development. So a lot of the facilities are temporary, just like the ones shown here. As you know, that most of the items and sports for the Winter Olympics are organized outdoors. Some are indoors in Yanqing and Chongli, in mountainous areas. It's quite difficult to put in place such engineering projects. Also, we try to minimize our impact over agricultural activities and the forest ecosystem. So that is why we are using a lot of the temporary facilities and because it's quite easy to set up, it's also quite easy to dismantle those facilities. So this is the observatory deck or the audience uh, seats. They look very short, but on the mountain slopes, it's actually very tall. And this is a photo from the real scene. You can see that this is 15 to 20 meters tall, and some are even larger. So this is just for the spectators. Uh, at the very back row, we have some uh, journalists' seats, and we also have uh, broadcasters, uh, studios. So take a look at this one. This is the studio room for journalists. And from our footage, you can see that this building is 100% built above the scaffolds. And this is quite different from those traditional buildings that are built on solid foundations. So these are just temporary facilities, and it's very easy to build up. It's also very easy to uh, dismantle. And these are basically scaffolds, and you can see those uh, kind of structures in a lot of the construction sites across the country. So let me just interrupt here. So how many of the facilities in Beijing 2022 will be like this? Well, 
This is just for the spectators' seats.、Uh, for the spectators' seats, the studio rooms for journalists and photographers, and also for broadcasters. I believe. If the games are outdoors, 70 to 80 percent of the facilities would be outdoors. So that's a huge proportion. Yes, we're talking about tens of thousands of spectator seats here. All right. So now you can see that you know it's built on those scaffolds. Is it safe? Is it safe and secure? How do we guarantee the safety? Well, this is some big concern of all the people out there. But rest assured that we can guarantee safety.、Uh, number one, there is this issue of structure, and also we have to put in place a monitoring system during games time. If there are some components that are running loose, we can immediately. Identify the situation. So this is the job that we are doing, and so we are also doing the design for this kind of structure. In addition to design, we are also doing monitoring, and we are doing a lot of the jobs to guarantee the safety during games time. So my colleague, Mr. Liu Gang, Professor Liu Gang, will give you additional information. So say hello to our viewers. Good afternoon, dear audience. So right now, this is another、uh, steel structure. And what kind of structure is this?、Uh, why is it here? So. Uh, during games time, we have to put a layer of snow that is one to two meters above the ground, and all、uh, the spectators they are watching the games on these、uh, scaffolds to ensure safety.、Uh, we have a lot of designs, and also after the games, this will be dismantled and it will be reused again in some future events. So this is exactly the same structure as the one used in Beijing. Yes, exactly. So can we can we go up the platform? Yes, you can. But be careful. This is not exactly one to one. This is not exactly identical to the ones that we use in Beijing. So right now we are at the spectators. Platform. So for platforms, there are areas for spectators to watch the game while standing, and there are also spectators' seats. Basically, the spectators they can sit down, and some of them can stand up. So we have identified a couple of risk points. Number one, overloading. So if there is a huge crowd. If it goes、uh, beyond the low capacity, and that may generate a risk, and also overcrowding in one designated area, and this is also a danger. So how do you guarantee? How do you how do you monitor those risks, and how do you guard against those risks? So we have sensors、uh, equipped. On this、uh, structure, and I can show you more details later. And also, the third concern is that we are talking about 2,000 to 3,000 spectators, and、uh, there are、uh, stability issue of the、uh, foundation of the mountainous slopes. So we are monitoring the stability of the、uh, landscapes as well as the stability of our own structure. Well, I can see some of your colleagues have、uh, lined up, and I believe later we can expect some experiments. Yes, you're right, and this is simply to tell you how we monitor the safety of the scaffolding. All right. After listening to your introduction, I can't wait to see the experiment.、Uh, now let's check out the experiment、uh, to see whether it can identify risks. So now you can take a look at those sensors on board of、uh, those、uh, scaffolds. Well, if we zoom in, you can see that we have a lot of、uh, wireless sensors. So, what are those sensors for? So, this is to、uh, monitor the torque and pressure and load. 
on the steel bar and in general, a human person may weigh 50 to 80 kilos. Uh, if there is any tilting, we can monitor this deformation. So we also have an acceleration monitor, which can tell us whether an area is uh, overpressurized and whether the tenacity of the building can meet the standard. So now you can see that below the surface we have three very precise monitors, and these monitors will tell us whether the audience above there is in a safe situation. Uh, if there are any dangers, those sensors they can sound the alarm. And also, we have to talk about evacuation. Uh, if there is any safety uh, hazard, we will initiate the evacuation procedures, and we can make sure that all the spectators can be evacuated in an orderly fashion. All right, Professor Liu has told us the functions of those sensors, and now Professor Liu will give a command to uh, the crew standing there. So are you ready? Now let's start experiment number one. Just jump on the platform. So now you can see that they have uh, jumped. Now you can hear the alarm. And this means that there is some danger. So I don't know if you have heard of that, but I heard that very clearly that when the eight crew members jumped simultaneously on the platform, the sensors monitored the situation and gave an alarm. So this means that some of the parameters have gone out of range, and that is why we have received the alarm sent us by the monitors and sensors. So how many? Uh, how many sensors do you have? So we have uh, 30 uh, sets of facilities that have been equipped with uh, sensors. And also this equipment and these facilities, uh, these facilities and they will be stationed, they will be deployed at the uh, games venue until the very end of the games. Yes, you're right. Uh, we are only going to dismantle those uh, facilities after the game and, and during games time, the maintenance staff at the games venue, they will be able to uh, watch the monitors and they can also uh, carefully manage those facilities. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Liu. And now back to Mr. Yang. So I have another question, and I just observed these experiments, but these scaffolds, they are relatively short, and this is like two to three meters, but the facilities that you deployed at the venue, those are 20 to 30 meters tall, and how do you guarantee the safety of uh, such large temporary scaffolds? Now, if you take a closer look, you can see the structure. We have different beams and bars, and there is a lock equipment in Yanqing game zone, we are using a square-shaped uh, joint. So you can see this is how they get connected. And we have a lock system that can connect the horizontal and vertical bar. So it can lock itself automatically. And it's very simple physics, actually. So we have a lock right here. And if I just put it vertically in it, the more pressure there is and the more solid it will be locked into the uh, system. We also have different components marked by different colors, for example, red or yellow. Uh, when you cannot see the red color, this means that it's in a perfect lock uh, situation. Uh, if you can still see the color, this means that uh, it's not quite in a position. So let me ask another question. So those are set up manually on site. So how do you guarantee that they are in a perfect lock position? Well, this is truly a very big safety concern. And if you're not doing that very well, you can 
expect some deformation. So we have color coding system, and you have to rely on your naked eyes. But if you only rely on this color coding system, it would be very exhausting just to rely on human labor, because we have a lot of bolts here, and we have a lot of latches here. So if we are talking about one game zone, that may give you more than ten thousand such、uh, latches or bolts. You're quite right. So that is why we are rely on drones, and we rely on a drones team to、uh, patrol around these facilities. So the drones they can capture those anomalies and warn us about the potential hazard. So tell us more about the drones that you are using. So I have my colleague who can give you. Some additional introduction. So now our guest is called Hui Yi. And so just take a look at this drone. And this is a quite ordinary drone, but it's equipped with some special softwares and hardwares. So as Professor Yang has mentioned, that once you can see this、uh, red bar, the red line, this means that it's not in a perfect locking system. So once you capture this、uh, phenomenon, it shows that the latch is in a very loose situation,、uh, and we will immediately deploy some、uh, technicians to get the problem fixed. So now let's have a demo. All right. So from the footage, you can see from these screens here, you can see what our drones. What our drone can see, and now our drone is approaching the structure. So this is what it can see, and right now we're not spotting any red lines. So let me just give you another experiment, and let me artificially make loose of one bolt or one latch. So this one is loose. So now let's、uh, run the、uh, drone here and. Let's say, let's see if、uh, our drone can identify this potential hazard. All right, now it's on it. It has located this area, and also there is this alarm indicated on our system. So this is a 3D. Modeling and it can very precisely locate the position of the hazard. So just now, our drone has scanned this physical structure. And I don't know if you have heard of that, but the alarm has been given, reminding our technicians that this is the place. This is the position of the hazard, and so immediately they will send some technician to the hazard. So you you said it very well, and we have more than tens of thousands of、uh, latches, and we have to deploy our drones. And during games time, our drones are deployed, and they will be standing by, and they will be patrolling all the latches and bolts, and they can just ensure that all the latches they are in a perfect lock position. So just now during the experiment, Mr. Hui Yi, give us a demo where the drone could very easily、uh, spot this hazard. So, how well can be this applied in reality? And now I will ask my colleague to play a footage, and this is a footage showing how the drones are working in real circumstances. And I believe that you were there as well. Yes, I was there with the team, and you can see that we have a lot of.、Uh, Scaffolds on the scene. We have drones deployed, and it's quite tall. And it's 20 to 30 meters because it's very tall. We are deploying our drones, and it's faster and more efficient. So in Yanqing, so how well did the inspection go? 
So we had more than 100,000 latches, but within one hour, we have completed the patrol, and the overall quality is well up to the standard. So we were quite relieved after the quality inspection. So just now you have heard that. So they deployed professional teams to the Yanqing game zone, and they conducted a professional inspection. And through a professional patrol, the conclusion was reached that more than 100,000 such latches were in a perfect lock position. So if you have a chance to go to the game zone, to go to the venue, you can be rest assured that you are in safe hands because we are using those professional equipment and technologies to ensure safety. All right, Professor Yang, so what is your next masterpiece that you want to show us. So the next technology has to do with the frozen soil because in Zhang Jiakou and in Yanqing, it's very cold there. And all those uh, scaffolds, they are uh, um, frozen soil. And uh, when there are people moving above or on those uh, scaffolds, and the frozen, the frozen soil, they are not in a very solid uh, situation. Uh, that is to say that during the night's time, it can be frozen, and during day's time, with the sunshine, it will melt a little bit, and that will have an influence or impact to the stability of our scaffolds. And also, we're talking about different areas. Some are in the sunshine, some are in the shade, some may get frozen very seriously, and some may not be uh, in a frozen uh, situation. So this will leave different types of or levels of uh, impact to the stability of the scaffolds. And now I will hand it over to our colleague. So Mr. Yang, tell us what is your research about? So now let me give you a general introduction. So the Olympic Winter Games is held in winter around February. So we paid quite a number of visits to Yanqing and Zhang Jiakou. It's an area with a temperature of uh, minus 10 to uh, 0 degrees. We have a lot of uh, high rises as temporary facilities, for example, the uh, broadcast tower, the signal tower. We also have spectator states, temporary uh, spectators platform that's built with uh, these uh, scaffolds. And the spectators, they may move around on the platform, and they will generate different levels of impact to the load of the bottom part of the scaffolds. And that will cause some sort of uh, deformation to the frozen soil. Uh, when the temperature is very low, uh, the soil may get frozen. And that will generate a force to the scaffolds. But when the temperature rises, uh, the, frozen, the frozen soil may uh, melt. And then the scaffolds may be uh, sunken deeper into the soil. So uh, these are the different situations that we are expecting. To solve this problem, me and my team, we have uh, come up with this uh, insulation, uh, freeze control, scaffolds uh, technology. And this is a technology that can ensure the following uh, features. So it's quite easy to uh, deploy this technology, and within a couple of minutes, you can deploy this kind of facilities. And also, you can go well with uh, different forms of uh, landscape. So because of the temperature changes and the different types of soil, there are influencing factors quite uncertain, so that is why we have to put a insulation layer. 
So that is why we are talking about this technology here. So we have a platform um, that is uh, built in the soil, and it is only on top of this platform that we are setting up these scaffolds. The advantage of this one is that it can go very well with the 3D uh, landscapes of the mountain slopes, and also it can be recycled. And after the Winter Olympics, we can recycle and reuse these uh, facilities. And uh, here I have uh, prepared a prototype, and you can take a look. So this is a model that we use in a laboratory. Uh, the very bottom layer is the frozen soil layer. So above this uh, frozen soil layer, we have uh, four columns or four pillars that go deeply into the soil. And um, on, on top of these uh, columns, we have a temporary platform. Uh, it is only on top of this platform that we deploy our scaffolds and then um, maybe our um, signal tower and broadcaster, broadcast tower. So now I will hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Li. So Dr. Li will talk you more about the pillar or the pole that we insert into the frozen frozen soil. So this is basically for insulation purposes, and we have a uh, steel bar that can go deeply into the soil, and you can take a look at this structure, and it can be drilled into the soil, and you can take a look at the blades here, and this is simply to cut through the soil, and with the a very wide shade, it can increase the contact area between the bar and the soil, and we can use drilling machines to drill this bar deeply into the soil. So this way, we don't need to dig up the soil, we don't need to transport the soil elsewhere, so it can be directly drilled into the floor, into the earth. And also, we can take it back by uh, moving to the opposite direction, so it can be quickly deployed, and also after use, it will be recycled. Now take a look at this uh, insulation um, box. Traditionally, all the equipments they try to increase the contact area between the uh, pole and the earth. But we are using a different approach. We are using this insulation box. So when we drill this bar into the frozen soil, we can guarantee that uh, this section is also buried in the frozen soil. So which means that when the frozen soil changes in different temperature, the movement will only happen to this insulation part. So this will minimize the impact of the frozen soil to the ground structure. So this is giving us a lot of requirements. For example, our load has to retain certain parameters, and also our torque has to reach uh, different um, parameters. So we have uh, built a analysis platform, and this can help us analyze the different deformations and different torque and load and pressure. So with this system, we can very precisely analyze the different load, and we also we also have come up with a very uh, efficient installation uh, scheme. So this is basically our system. So how many members do you have in a design team? So we have uh, just three. Uh, these two, they are my uh, fellow members, and we are jointly led by Professor Yang. So you are a doctor. Yes. So they are students at the Chongqing University, and they are using their own wisdom to contribute. 
to the Winter Olympics, and their solution is quite advantageous, and they can deal with some uh, very challenging situations on the venue. All right, Professor Yang, do we have anything else? So we have a wind tunnel experiment. Uh, well, talking about wind tunnel, I believe this is mainly for aerodynamics, for uh, airplanes, and for fighter jet. But for architecture, for civil engineering, I don't know there are wind tunnels. And what is that for? So traditionally, we were basically focused on high rises or super tall buildings or airports, for example, the bird's nest, and also some of the landscape towers at the Olympic area. So we have undertaken a lot of programs in the past. So this is the wind tunnel we are talking about. So now they have a blue color equipment. So that is the wind tunnel they are talking about.、Uh, how long is this component? So you can see that we have a big fan that can blow the air into this part. So we have many different sections: the stabilizing section, the contracting section. So those are professional terminologies of wind tunnel technology.、Uh, we have to simulate the airflow and the wind of our structures in the venue. So we have to carefully adjust the different parameters. So this is the experimental section、uh, for the Olympic Winter Games, and we are basically doing. An experiment for the wind situation in Chongli and in Yanqing game zone. These are two mountainous areas, and there are a lot of games going on there. So, for example, we have、uh, speed skating, we have、uh, alpine skiing, and ski jumping. All these sports they have a lot to do with wind. The wind can be a resistance, and the wind can affect their performance. So the wind, they can also have an impact to the、uh, safety of the temporary facilities and how well、uh, can your facility、uh, guard against wind. I believe、uh, you are considering this as well. Yes, you're right. And for example, if we have a temporary structure. Of、uh, 30 meters tall, and if there are buildings on top of that, so we have to use the wind tunnel to analyze the wind power. So can we run a quick test with your equipment? So I will give you another doctor student, Doctor Li. All right, Doctor Li, can you quickly run this experiment? So here you can see that we have some、uh, landscapes, and this is a replica of the mountain slopes in the game zone of Beijing 2022. So there are different types of landscapes, different、uh, slopes. So how do you understand how the wind is affecting the landscape? So yes, you're right. We have a sand plate here, and this is simulating the、uh, ski resort and the skiing track. So it's quite difficult to simulate the wind speed on such a large square. So that is why we are using wind tunnels. So we're using a lot of models. Uh, this can tell you directly the relationship between the mountain slopes and the wind tunnels.、Uh, if we are talking about a wind that comes from、uh, tens of、uh, kilometers away, so we have to use this wind tunnel. We need to adjust the parameters of the wind, and we can virtually simulate the strength of the wind. So we can run a quick. 
demonstration here. So if we turn on the wind tunnel, you can see how the wind goes. And the wind is uh, color coded by a smoke. So we are initiating this system, and now you can take a look. So we are right now mimicking a wind at the gratitude, uh, a wind at the level of uh, two. So you can see that and this smoke is uh, distributed unequally on the slope. So this gives you two lessons. Number one, there is this impact from the environment. And also, the acidity's performance they can be affected as well. So it is under those circumstances that you have to rely on this wind tunnel. And also, you have to run a lot of simulations on the computer. Uh, Dr. Li Ziyang is an expert of 3D modeling. So we can actually simulate the impact of the wind on the performance of athletes. So now you can see the direction of the wind, the uh, direction of the smoke, and this will tell you how wind is affecting the performance of the athletes. And also you have another lab, which accommodates a lot of computers. I believe you're running a lot of models and modeling there. So give us more introduction about those parameters. And can you manually adjust those manuals, uh, those parameters? Yes, you're right. And this is the observation and control system. And we can change the speed of the wind. We can change the stress of the wind. And we can also uh, understand the impact of the wind to different uh, landscapes. So actually, uh, the mountain uh, is put on a plate that can rotate. So when it rotates, we can simulate wind from different directions. So right now, we have not included all the different uh, speed, and uh, we are currently looking at the uh, pressure of the wind and also the wind uh, in different directions. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for giving us such comprehensive introduction. So, Professor Yang, I believe that your team is just very professional. You have considered all the different aspects. Yes, uh, thank you for your compliment. I believe Olympic Winter Games is a very important national and international event, so we are more than honored to make our own contributions. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for bring your program to this uh, laboratory. And if any of the viewers are interested, in, they are also welcome to pay a visit to our laboratory. All right. So just now, with Professor Yang, we have gone through the different systems and solutions for those temporary facilities of Winter Olympic Games. I believe that you have uh, come to a similar conclusion. You know that the Games is not just held in Beijing, it's held in Zhangjiakou, but it's supported by forces and technical teams from across the country. Here in Chongqing, they are making their own contributions to the Winter Games. As the Games draw near, and let's hope and let's wish a resilient success of the Games. All right, this is all from the Chongqing University. Uh, thank you very much for watching. See you next time.